Okay, Bismillah, Walhamdulillah, Wa Usalli, Wa Usalli, Mu'al al Mabuthi, Rahmatullil Alameen, Nabiyina, Wa Habibina, Muhammad, Wa Ala Alihi, Wa Sahbihi, Ajma'in. So we're moving on to the chapter in Al Adab al Mufrad entitled Bab Qublat al Sibyan, Chapter Kissing Children, Chapter on Kissing the Children. And on, in this chapter, our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Aisha radiallahu anha she reports that Ja'a Arabiyun ila Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that a Bedouin Arab came to the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam and we know uh, that the Bedouins generally were quite coarse of nature they're quite harsh they're quite abrasive and so and they didn't really like showing emotion publicly they didn't like showing any f- for them a show of emotion was a sign of weakness. So, this Bedouin Arab came to the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he said, أَتُقَبِّلُونَ سِبْيَانَكُمْ Do you kiss your children? فَمَا نُقَبِّلُهُمْ Because we don't kiss our children. Do you kiss your children? Because we don't kiss our children. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَوَ أَمْلِكُ لَكَ أَنْ نَزَعَ اللَّهُ مِنْ قَلْبِكَ الرَّحْمَةِ That... Can I help it if Allah has stripped your heart of mercy? I can't help you if Allah has stripped your heart of mercy. I can't help you, or can I help it, if Allah has stripped your heart of mercy? Now this, uh, this statement or this incident, it happened on a number of occasions with different people during the life of the Messenger, والسلام, and on each occasion he said something similar. How can I help you if Allah has removed mercy and compassion and love from your hearts? And so... This hadith, the reason why Imam Bukhari is quoting it here, is to give us an example of how we should be showing love and affection to our children. So in the previous chapters we've learned about the importance of showing love and compassion and mercy to our children. And this hadith gives us an example of how to do it. A very powerful, very strong example. And that is for the parent, be the parent, a father or a mother. It's not, not just mothers, but parent, fathers as well. That they kiss their children. That they kiss their children. And this is recommended actually for the parents to do. To kiss their children. Because when the parent kisses their child. It shows them affection. It shows them love. And that child feels love, loved. And that child feels the, uh, comfortable and happy. And being brought up in a uh, supportive household. Supportive environment. And this has a very strong positive effect on the upbringing of a child. When a parent shows outwardly and... In, Emotion, to, positive emotion towards a child, that child will have a better upbringing and will become more stable as he or she grows up. So it is recommended for a father or a mother to kiss the child. Some scholars, such as Nawawi, even say it's obligatory. It's actually a foreign, it's actually an obligation upon the parents to kiss the child. The stronger view is it's recommended, but this shows how much emphasis the scholars of Islam placed on. This simple act of kissing children. And it's something that, as I said, I mentioned previously, it's something that we're lacking in our communities, especially amongst our Pakistani Asian subcontinent communities, where showing signs of affection publicly and outwardly to your child is seen to be unparent like, unfather like, unmother like. It's not really the, the role of the father, especially, to kiss his children in public. Or even kiss his children in his household. This, this display of affection doesn't really happen in our societies. But this is against the sunnah of our messenger, alayhi salatu as we will see. It's against the teachings of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa We should be showing public displays of affection towards our children. So loving our children and showing public displays of affection to the children or showing displays of affection publicly is a recommendation in Islam. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He was so uh, Not surprised but he was He wanted to really emphasize How much Good the parent that came to him was lacking in his family In his upbringing of his children In his bringing up their children So he said to this father a very strong statement How can I help you? If Allah has removed mercy from your heart. How can I help you if Allah has removed mercy from your heart? This is a very strong statement. 
It's a very potent statement. How can I help you if Allah has removed mercy from your heart? Meaning that if you're not kissing your children, then this is a sign that Allah has taken this mercy out of your heart. Taking the compassion out of your heart and you are beyond my help now. And you are now beyond my help. A very powerful statement. And he asked it as a rhetorical question because he wants this Bedouin Arab to think. And he wants to make this Bedouin Arab correct the serious flaw that he has of not showing, kissing his children. And from this response of the Messenger we, uh, we also learn that a person should correct the mistakes of another when they fall short. If we see somebody else falling short in his duty towards Allah, in his practice of Islam, be it in an obligation, be it in a recommendation, we should advise that individual in the best of ways. In the best of ways. Here the Messenger of Allah chose a rhetorical question to advise that individual. But you take him to the side, you advise him, you advise her, try to correct that, correct that error, that, that shortcoming that a person has. And we also learn something very quick, very important. And that is that what's inside a person's heart must show out, must have some sort, sort, sort of public display. They must, it must appear somehow on the body. And if it's, not in, if it's not correctly in our hearts, or if it's only weakly in our hearts, then it won't show properly. But if it's truly in our hearts, and it's embedded in our hearts, then it will show on our limbs, it will show in our character, it will show in our behaviour. So if mercy is there in our hearts, if mercy is truly entrenched in our hearts like it should be, without a doubt it will show in our, in our behaviour. Without a doubt it will show in the way we deal with other people. And one of the ways it will, de- it will show is how we deal with our children, how we deal with our parents, how we deal with our kith and kin. If that mercy is in our hearts, it will show outwardly. And if it's not showing outwardly, we have a problem. We have a problem. We don't have a quality in our hearts that Allah loves. Or we don't have a quality in our hearts as it should be there that Allah is, that is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it's not showing outwardly, we need to strengthen that quality of mercy in our hearts. Because our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us that Allah loves those people who are merciful. Allah loves those people who are merciful. So if it's not displaying on our limbs, it's lacking in our hearts. Likewise, love. Allah loves those people who love, who show love to others. If we're not showing love to others, it's lacking in our hearts. Likewise, if the actions of Iman are not showing on our limbs and upon our tongue, it's lacking in our hearts. And we need to rectify it and strengthen our Iman. The inner has an effect on the outer. What's inside our hearts must manifest outwardly. And if it's not manifesting outwardly, there's a problem there that needs to be rectified. So mercy in our hearts, if it's truly there, will show outwardly. Love in our hearts, if it's truly there, will show outwardly. Iman in our hearts, if it's truly there, must show outwardly. And this is why some of the scholars mentioned this, a very important point, even though it's theoretical in its nature. They said that if a person claims to have Iman, if a person claims to be a believer, Yet, never once does he do an action of Iman on his limbs or upon his tongue. His claim to Iman is false. That if you claim to have Iman in your heart, but never once in your lifetime do you ever do an action of Iman on your limbs, or never say an action, a statement, make a statement of Iman on your tongue, then you, are li- then you are lying. Because Iman, by its nature, must manifest on the limbs of an individual. It must manifest outwardly. And if it's not manifesting outwardly, your claim is a lie. The Iman must manifest outwardly. So this hadith, uh, it stresses to us the recommendation of showing displays of affection and love and mercy to our children, amongst which is kissing them. And linked to this is the second hadith of Abu Huraira that uh, he quotes, لَقَبَّلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ حَسَنْ إِبْنَ عَلِي وَعِنْدَهُ الْأَقْرَى إِبْنَ حَابِسَ التَّمِيمِ جَالِسٌ فقال, So one time, and this is in public, the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم, he kissed his grandson Hassan ibn Ali. He kissed his grandson ibn Hassan ibn Ali. 
And one of the companions was sitting with him, Al Aqra ibn Habis al Tamimi. And he was extremely taken aback by seeing the Messenger of Allah kissing his grandson. And in his view, or in the view, as I said, of the Bedouins, it was a, of some of the Bedouins, it was a sign of weakness. It's for a leader, especially a leader of the state, to the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu salam, to show affection like this in public. So he is taken aback. And he says to him, Inna li ashratan, ashratan min al walad. I have ten children. I have ten children. Ma qabbaltu minhum ahada. I have never kissed any one of them. I have never kissed any one of them. In another narration he said, I have never kissed anyone at all. Meaning any person at all. فَنَذَرَ إِلَيْهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ And now the Messenger of Allah looks at him in shock. So where Al-Aqra was now surprised seeing the Messenger of Allah kiss her husband, now the Messenger of Allah is looking at Al-Aqra in surprise as well. And he says, مَنْ لَا يَرْحَمْ لَا يُرْحَمْ Whoever does not show mercy to another will not be shown mercy. Whoever does not show mercy to another will not be shown mercy. So, again, this hadith emphasizes the point we're making. That kissing and showing love and affection to children is a sign of mercy and it is recommended. And the scholars mentioned also, when they're discussing this hadith, that by the Messenger of Allah saying, emphasizing this point about mercy, he is telling us the reason why we kiss children. The reason why we kiss the children is out of mercy. It's not out of lust, it's not, nothing like that at all. The reason why we're kissing children is out of mercy, for, for, out of love that a parent has for the child. And it's for this reason that some scholars, not all, but some scholars, they actually said it's disliked for a parent to kiss the child on the lips, on the lips directly. Because there's a danger that that might lead down to something else. You know, there might be something, something there's a danger that shaitan might get, shaitan might get in there. So they say it's dislike to do this, but the kissing, they said kissing on the cheeks, kissing on the forehead, kissing the hands, kissing even the feet, as many parents do, kissing the feet of a baby, all of this is recommended. All of this is recommended. Show mercy and mercy will be shown to you. Whoever does not, show, whoever does not have mercy, whoever does not show mercy to others will not be shown mercy. This is a general principle taught by the Messenger, alayhi salatu salam. Whoever does not show mercy to others will not be shown mercy. هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Allah says in the Qur'an What is a reward of goodness except for goodness? It's the principle that Allah lays out in the Qur'an The reward for goodness is goodness The reward for mercy is mercy The reward for love is love The reward for gentleness is gentleness The reward for overlooking somebody's mistake is overlooking somebody's mistake in, From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Is there a reward for good? Anything but good وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْك that just as Allah has been good to you, be good to others. Just as Allah has been good to you, be good to others. And from amongst those that have the greatest right of us being good to them is our children and our parents and our close kith and kin. So those who are not merciful in this world will not be shown mercy. In this world or the next by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the scholars said, as I said, this is a general principle. So they said those who are not merciful to themselves, there are a number of applications to this this principle that Allah's Messenger has laid out. Whoever does not show mercy to others will not show, be, be shown mercy. That whoever, an application of this or an example of this is that if you're not merciful to yourself, if you're not merciful to yourself, how can you be merciful to yourself? It doesn't mean going out and lavishing yourself with gifts and taking your, having a nice meal in a restaurant or buying nice clothes. How can you be merciful to yourself? Any ideas? Yeah? No? Yeah. By following the truth. A person who follows the truth that has been revealed by Allah and His Messenger is actually being merciful to himself. Avoiding what displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being merciful to yourself. So if a person does not show mercy to himself in this way, will not be shown mercy by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
A person who does not show mercy to others, mankind around him, will not be shown mercy by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and so on and so forth. And uh, we are reminded in this hadith, as a final point in this hadith, about the hereafter. That whoever does not show, show mercy in this world will not be shown mercy in the hereafter. We are, by the Messenger of Allah highlighting this to us, he is emphasizing to us the reason behind us showing love and affection, compassion and mercy to other people. Aside from the, the natural compassion and mercy that is there, we are not showing mercy and compassion and love to others for worldly benefit. We're not showing it to gain something back. We're not showing it to gain some prestige or position. We're doing it to gain Allah's pleasure in the hereafter. That's our goal. That's our reason. We are people of the hereafter. That's what we're here for, to focus on the hereafter and live for the hereafter. So these acts of compassion, yes, they're natural human acts, but we're doing them also to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for a worldly gain. So that when we meet our Lord Most High, we would meet Him as servants that He is pleased with, that He is content with. We then move on to the next chapter. Any questions so far in this chapter? So, Bab Adabil Walidi wa Birrihi li Walidihi. The chapter heading is The parent teaching his child Adab and his being good to his child uh, and, and his duty towards his child. So, the parent. Teaching his child adab, manners, good manners. And the, child, the parent being good to his child. The parent teaching his child adab and the child being, being good to his, to his uh, child. So, Imam Bukhari, rahmatullah, he quotes a statement of Numair ibn Aus, who's a companion. That, anna uh, he said, Kanu yaqulun, that the Sahaba used to say, As salahu min Allahi. Righteousness comes from Allah. Righteousness and good action and good conduct, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a gift from Him. And adab wal adabu min al aba. And adab comes from the parents. So for the child, adab comes from the parents. So righteousness. And being a good person, this is a gift that Allah gives whoever He wants. But adab, it comes from the parents. The first school and the most important school for a child is his mother and father. The upbringing that the mother and father give to impart to a child cannot be matched by anybody else. And it cannot be matched definitely or not by secular schools and the schools we send our children to. The upbringing we, we give is something that sticks to the child. And if the upbringing is bad, the child will be brought up bad. And if the upbringing is good, then the child will at least have a foundation, of st uh, a strong foundation that he can build upon. So if you imagine many families, well, he has a bill, unfortunately, parents are arguing, mother is arguing with the father, the father's swearing at the, the mother, the, mo the father's beating the mother, mother might be beating the father, as, as some cases I've dealt with in the past. <laughs> um, the, um, it's, we laugh, but and, uh, unfortunately, I laughed when I first dealt with something like this, but it's actually very, very sad. But um, we find that the parents are beating the children. All the parents talk about is money, money, money. All the parents talk about is, you know, when's the next, uh, what this person said and what that person said. Imagine a child being brought up in that environment. What sort of environment is that to bring up a child in? And the parents are responsible for this. And then compare that with an environment where the parent, where the mother and father are living in harmony. They have a good, stable marriage. They're respectful of each other. They recognize the good in each other. And when they have disagreements, they disagree in the absence of a children, not in front of a children. They don't swear, they don't lie, they teach their children good manners. The difference is between night and day. The child being brought up. Manners in Islam, brothers, manners are not taught through books. Manners are not taught, they're actually through words, they're taught but through action. The children, they learn from their parents, they see their parents. Children can see hypocrisy in parents and they notice it. If you're telling your child to do one thing but you're doing the other, the child will see that as, as an act of hypocrisy. And it is an act of hypocrisy. We need to be examples for our children. We have to be examples for our children. 
for our own sakes and for their sakes as well. For our, our own sakes, that they, 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 that as a result, they, come up, they, they, are, they are raised as righteous children who make dua for their parents. And when we pass away, they make dua for, our, for us as, as parents. And they benefit us in the hereafter. For our own sakes and for their sakes. So they actually, we give them what they need to be successful Muslims in this world. And more importantly, in the hereafter as well. They can meet Allah and be successful and live for eternity in his vicinity, in his neighborhood, in his jannah. And this is why in one hadith, which some scholars said is weak, one hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the best gift a parent can give his child is, who knows? The best gift a parent can give his child is? Manners, good adab. The best gift a parent can give the child is good adab. The best gift a parent can give the child is good adab. And as I said, adab is taught not by reading a book, but it's taught through action. It's taught through how we live our lives. It's taught through how we engage with other people and how we behave with other people. The second hadith that Imam Bukhari quotes in this, in this chapter. It's a hadith of Numan bin Bashir. He said that my father he carried him what brought me to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the reason why uh, he brought him to the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, was because he gave a gift to his son. And that gift was actually a slave to actually you know, help bring up this, the child. And this gift was given to the son as a, re- on, uh, as a request by, from his mother. The mother told the, fa- told the father, I want you to give, give this gift to my son, not Mani bin Bashir. And then when he gave it to me, after some hesitation, she said that I won't be satisfied with you giving this gift to, the, to, to my son until we have, you have made the Messenger of Allah bear testimony to, you, to the fact that he gave this gift to my son. So she wanted him to go and tell the Messenger of Allah about the gift that, she's, that he's giving his son. And so, you know, as most fathers do, they listen to their wives. <laughs> so he went... He went to uh, the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. And he said, I've come to you to have you bear witness to the fact that I'm giving this gift to my son, not Mani bin Bashir. And this gift, as I said, was a slave. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasalam asked him a question. Uh, have you given the same gift to every single one of your children? Have you given the same gift to every single one of your children? He said, no. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, in that case, go to someone else to bear witness. Go somewhere else to bear witness. I'm not going to give any testimony to this. In another narration of this incident, don't ask me to witness injustice. Don't ask me to witness injustice. And in another narration, I only bear witness to the truth. Don't ask me to witness injustice, I only bear witness to the truth. Do you not want to show equal kindness to all of them? He said, of course. Do you not want to show equal kindness to all of them? He said, of course. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, فَلَا uh, إِذَنْ In that case, don't give a gift to only one of your children. In that case, don't give a gift to only one of your children. So, in this hadith, we are learning a very important lesson. And that important lesson we've talked about in a previous session is, ex- uh, is exemplified by a statement of the, of the Messenger, alayhi salatu He said, أولادكم, Fear Allah and treat your children fairly. Fear Allah and treat your children fairly. And this is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in another hadith, he said, treat your children equally when you are giving them gifts. Treat your children equally when you are giving them gifts. But if I was to prefer, prefer one over another when, in terms of giving gifts, I would prefer the daughter over the son. But if I was to give preference when giving gifts, I would actually prefer the daughter over the son. Again, something that we don't really see in our societies, we normally give preference to sons over daughters. 
But the Messenger of Allah is saying, I would have given preference to the daughter over the son. And one time, a man was sitting with a Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and his son came running to him. We quoted this hadith previously. And he kissed that man, he kissed that son, and then he placed him in his lap. And then his daughter came. And he just, he took her and he put her to, to his side, made her sit by his side. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa when he saw this, he said, you have not treated them equally. When he saw this, he said, you have not treated them equally. He kissed one and put him in the lap, but the daughter, he didn't kiss her, he just put her by his, made her sit by his side. So, we need to be fair in terms, when we give gifts to our children, we need to be fair. Of course, it's natural for a parent to sometimes love one child more than another. This is just, it's normal. Even though parents will admit it, often, it's true, it just, it's, it's there. A parent will often love one child more than another. But it's upon the child, the parent, not to make that translate into injustice and unfairness or, or uh, injustice between the, between the siblings, between the children. So he, despite the fact that a parent might love one child more than another, he needs to treat the children fairly outwardly. Or she needs to treat the children fairly outwardly. And one of the reasons behind this is that the goal of Islam is to build, about, is to build a strong family. The family is this, the building block of society. A strong family leads to a strong society. A strong family leads to a strong society, leads to a strong community. And if you have a family where the siblings are jealous of one another, because the parents are giving preference to one over another, if you have a family where the siblings are fighting one another because of the parents being uh, unfairly treating uh, their siblings, then, uh, or if you see a family where children are, ha they have their, their competing with one another for the, for the affection of their parents, this is an, uh, an unhealthy family. And it will lead to a weak family structure. And it will lead to a weak community. And it's for this reason, that one of the, for this wisdom, if you like, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is recommending us to treat them fairly. So we have a strong family, all of them who feel equally loved by their parents. Another important lesson that we learn from this hadith is not to jump to conclusions. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when uh, his, the father brought Norman ibn Bashir to him and told him that I've got, I gave him a gift, he didn't jump to a conclusion that either he must have given gifts to every other one of his child, children, or neither did he jump to a conclusion that he didn't give gifts to his other children. He asked the question first to clarify. So where is upon us, wherever possible, to clarify, to ask questions to clarify and not to jump to conclusions and not to make assumptions. Making assumptions and having suspicions and jumping to conclusions often leads to disputes and discord and breaking up of you know, brotherhood. We don't want that. We don't want to put rifts between people. So ask questions to clarify before jumping to conclusions. Like our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did in this hadith, teaching by example. So treating children equally, the majority of scholars say it's recommended. But some scholars like the Humblees, they said it's obligatory. It's actually an obligation upon the parents to treat their children equally. And they said that the only valid reason for you not to treat them equally when giving gifts is when there's a need to do so. When there's a genuine reason that one child needs something and he really needs it that other children don't. In which case you can, we can do it. But generally speaking, when giving gifts to our children, we need to treat them. We need to treat them fairly. And the final hadith of quote we'll, we'll finish with today, inshallah. Uh, it's in a new chapter. Babu birril abli walidihi. The father or the parent being dutiful, being good to his child. So in the first few chapters, if you remember back, we talked, we talked about the obligation of the children being dutiful to the parents. And now the Imam Bukhari, towards the end of these chapters now, he's turning it around. And he say now the duty of the parents to be dutiful to the children as well. And so he quotes the narration of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. إِنَّمَا سَمَّاهُمُ اللَّهُ أَبْرَارِ That Allah has called the righteous abrar, the term abrar in the Qur'an. إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ The righteous are in felicity, they in, in, in goodness. 
And abrar comes from the word bir, which is dutifulness. The word which means to be dutiful. So, Ibn Omar says that Allah called them abrar because they were dutiful to their parents and they were dutiful to their children. Allah called to the people who entered paradise al-abrar because they were dutiful to their children and they were dutiful to their, children, uh, to their parents, to both. And then he went on, went on to say, your parents have rights over you and your children have, have rights over you. Your parents have rights over you and your children have rights over you as well. Our children have rights over us. We talked about the rights of the parents over the children. Our children have rights over us. We talked about the rights in the previous chapters and hadith we've been talking about. Rights such as needing them, teaching them what they need to know Islamically. Rights such as showing them in our conduct adab, such they are taught adab. Rights such as being just between them. Rights such, such as showing them love and mercy. Rights such as engaging with them, talking to them. Living amongst them, not being absent, absent from their lives. All of these are the rights that our children have over us as parents. So Allah called them abrar because they were dutiful to their parents and to their children. And just as your parents have rights over you, your children have rights over you as well. And inshallah we'll stop there for today. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubi ilayk.